Okay, so as you can see, we are recording. I've been recording my video, uh, my, uh, my uh, class lectures uh, on video for uh, many years now, since long before COVID. And uh, as you all know, the big idea is that then after class is over, if you want to go back, if you, know, if you had trouble understanding something I said in class, you can go back, listen to it again, possibly multiple times, what have you, and uh, it's a uh, resource. So anyway, you have been officially informed we are recording. Um, okay, so uh, welcome to uh, Math 219, uh, Section 2, I believe it is. And um, uh, y'all have already heard me on the, rec on the recording that I announced uh, through Sakai uh, talk about all the stuff that's on this page. Um, I'm just going to hit a couple of real quick highlights. Um, these two Sakai sites... Make sure to read all of the information on those sites. Again, that's very important. There's lots of information there about uh, hmm, procedures, policies, logistics, you know, that kind of boring stuff. But it's all important, and you have to know it. So anyway, make sure to read that. Okay. Uh, next, uh, real quick, I want to talk about course grades. Um, so uh, this, again, I talked through in detail. Um, on the recording, so no need to go through all those details here. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize, if there was some aspect of that that you didn't understand or maybe really confused about, or if there's an ambiguity that you weren't sure which way it was going to go, come talk to me. I'll be very happy uh, to uh, clarify, elaborate, explain, uh, wh whatever. So I want to make sure everybody is perfectly clear on how course grades are going to work in this class. Um, and, uh, so anyway, come talk to me if you have questions. Um, so, uh, by the way, so that means either right after class is a, a really good time, typically. You can just catch me before I run out the door. Um, uh, or office hours. And um, uh, my office hours are Monday, Wednesday, Friday. What is it? Uh, 1120 to, to noon, I believe it is. Um, so it's a little before uh, this, uh, this class meeting. Okay. Last thing I want to emphasize is uh, this business about the learning goals. Um, and again, I, I talked about this at length, but uh, I just want to hit this again really quick to, to emphasize how important it is. You know, you want to make sure you uh, take the take the right class. Uh, don't take uh, the wrong approach to, uh, to to the to the class that we're actually in. Um, so uh, again, you, the, the focus in this course is understanding ideas. Now, in order to be able to understand the ideas that we're going to be talking about, yes, you do have to know certain facts and terminology and equations, and you need to be able to execute certain algorithms. Absolutely, yes, there's some rote uh, kind of stuff that unavoidably uh, we do have to do. But uh, that is all in service of making sure that you understand the ideas. So uh, keep this in mind. Keep this in the forefront of your mind. Um, as you uh, as you listen to lectures, as you do the homework assignments, um, as you uh, do you know, general studying and exam studying, etc., you want to make sure you understand what's really going on. And what are these objects that we're talking about? What are the uh, uh, interesting and useful properties that they have that we've described, etc. Okay. All right. So that's all I wanted to say about this. Uh, let me before I go on to doing some math. Uh, let me pause. Real quick, see if anybody has any questions. Anybody free? Okay. Um, while I'm thinking about it, let me uh, point out uh, questions are good. I encourage questions. Um, you'll recall that, in fact, I have a uh, an entire page somewhere. Uh, maybe it's on the course site here. Any second now. Here we go. Uh, yeah, asking questions. Right, whole page here about it, um, where I uh, point out um, various advantages that uh, you know some students might have not thought of about you know asking questions. Uh, for example, if you have a question about something, it could well be that a third of the class had the same question but didn't want to ask. Right. So anyway, it's uh, asking questions is a good thing. There are, of course, some kinds of questions that are better left for office hours. Uh, or after class, or something along those lines. Um, if you have a pretty good sense that your question is an office hours mm -hmm. question, by all means, wait for office hours. If you're not sure, feel free to ask now. Uh, and if it is, in fact, I, you know, really more appropriate as an office hours question, so I'll just tell you, it's no big deal, it's no problem, no imposition. So anyway, um, as you're reading the Sakai site, this is one of the things to, to look at. 
Okay, let's see. They're going back then to here. Okay. Um, before we get into the book math, I want to give you a quick introduction to, you know, why are we studying multivariable calculus? Uh, why is it important? Why is it useful? Why are you here? Um, now, to the latter question, uh, I think a lot of you may be here because your major requires it. Right. So, oh yeah, sure, I understand. So the, the uh, natural next question, though, to ask is why does your major require it? Um, and uh, it's ex uh, multivariable calculus is extremely useful, ultimately, is the answer. Um, and I think you all already understand that single variable calculus is important. Um, and uh, But uh, let me go ahead and make that case very quickly. Uh, the two big parts of single variable calculus, roughly speaking, derivatives and integrals. Think about it. Derivatives are about how things change. And, well, the world is just chock full of things changing. So understanding quantitatively how things are changing, boom, that's derivatives. So calculus, you see right there, is uh, just uh, uh, mind-bogglingly important. Um, integrals is the other, I'm going to say, uh, primary object of single variable calculus. Integrals are important too, perhaps not for the reason that you might think. A lot of people think integrals are area under a curve. And that the reason we need to be able to compute integrals is because we need to know, in so many cases, what the area is under a certain curve. This is actually not true. Uh, most of the time, area under a curve is a, it's a nice, geometrical kind of crutch. Uh, it's a visual aid, but deep down, fundamentally, area under a curve is usually not what we're actually interested in most of the time. Uh, most of the time, we're interested in computing other kinds of quantities, what I like to call accumulating quantities. Um, the idea being that there are uh, quantities which, if you um, take the whole that you're interested in, that you can chop it up into a bunch of little pieces, Compute the relevant quantity on each little piece, and then add them up. Right. So there's lots of types of quantities for which this is true. Um, mass, for example, the classic single variable example is uh, you have a one-dimensional rod, right, like a long metal rod, and maybe the alloy uh, is inconsistent throughout the rod. Maybe it's more iron and therefore heavier on this side, and a more aluminum and therefore lighter weight over on this side, and there's some sort of continuous thing. So how would you compute the total mass of that rod? The big idea is that the total mass, if you chop it up into little pieces and look at the mass of each individual little piece, that total mass is the sum of the masses of the little pieces. So this is what I mean by an accumulating quantity. And integrals are, a extreme, are an extremely powerful tool for computing accumulating quantities. And this mass of a rod example um, is uh, a classic example for how to do that. So, again, uh, I think this is um, hopefully preaching to the choir kind of a situation. You know, why is single variable calculus important? Ah, pretty good reasons there. Pausing again for questions before we go on. Everybody with me? Okay, so now let me complain a little bit about single variable calculus. Single variable calculus is one dimensional. The world that we live in is three dimensional. Well, there is the problem, <laughs> right? So now there are, of course, some situations, in fact, a lot of situations, where even though the world is three-dimensional, certain conveniences of the question might come up where you can effectively view the question as um, as really been kind of one-dimensional. So we have this, you know, one-dimensional rod example uh, to start. Um, but again, generally speaking, the world's three-dimensional. So let's think about this case. Uh, suppose we have um, temperature as a function of position in this room, for example. Right? So it's probably colder near the windows. It's probably warmer near that very bright bulb in the projector. Uh, somewhere in here, presumably, there's a uh, heat source uh, where the air is coming out, uh, hopefully warm. Doesn't seem to be working too well to me. It's a little crisp in here for my taste. But um, anyway. The, the temperature in this room is not a constant. It varies all over the room. And so uh, a question we could reasonably ask is, suppose I'm at this location, and suppose I am moving that way, some velocity. 
keeping in mind that as I've suggested by how I've drawn it here, I might not be moving exactly in the x direction or exactly in the y direction, etc. I might be moving kind of like that. You know, somewhat x ish, but also somewhat also somewhat up, just you know, at some angle in some direction. And if that's the case, then how do you compute how fast temperature is changing? But this is not a single variable calculus question. Right? We've got three different variables, x, y, and z. All of them matter, and I'm not going in the direction of any single one of them. So notice this is a um, highly relatable, real world, this is not ab obscure, weirdo, anything. This is a very natural question, uh, and it's multivariable calculus. And we're going to learn how to do this uh, in this course. Going to have to build up to it, but uh, we will eventually get to that. And then from an integrals point of view, here's another, I think, very relatable, very natural question. Suppose instead of a one-dimensional rod, suppose you have a three-dimensional lump. I mean, again, we live in a three-dimensional world. I don't experience a lot of one-dimensional rods in this world. I experience a lot of lumps of three-dimensional things. Right? So this is kind of the more generic question, really. Uh, if you have a three-dimensional thing. And the thing is, mass need not be distributed uniformly. You might have sort of more mass over there on the left side and then maybe less mass on the right. Maybe it's like really dense over on this edge. And then maybe there's a little real dense spot right over here as well. Something like that. So density is not a function of a single variable. If you were to try to, base, try to set up a single variable integral to compute mass of this by maybe taking slices or something like that, the well, problem is any slice, let's look at a slice right along in here, for example. That slice, yeah, you could talk about the area of it, and you could talk about maybe the thickness or something, but then the question comes up of what's the mass per unit volume inside of this slice, and well, it, uh, it's uh, lower up here and it's higher down here, and uh, we, we can't, we got nothing. We're dead in the water. Everybody see? So single variable calculus does not, uh, does not address questions like this. And we're going to have to develop a multivariable calculus idea. Just to give it away, it's called a triple integral. Something again we'll, we'll build up to, but we will have multivariable calculus ideas that are kind of single variable calculus like, but that will be um, more capable, more powerful to be able to handle situations like this. Okay, how are we doing? Feel free to, anybody? Okay. All, right. All right, okay, now these are kind of, I don't know. Um, the purpose of these examples, I'll say, is to show how simple and relatable, uh, and therefore how extremely common uh, questions are in this world that would require the use of multivariate topics. But now I'm going to show you a different category of questions, um, namely questions about specific fields of study. And so, for example, let's think about economics. Uh, here is a... Um, uh, a uh, kind of sort of example of how economics uh, works sometimes. Sometimes you have a bunch of variables, economic quantities, maybe price, uh, quantity produced, interest rates, capital labor, that kind of, you know, there's a bunch of different economic kinds of variables. And what do we know about them? Um, can I solve for one in terms of the other? Maybe not. Very often in economics, what they do is they write down a relationship between them that doesn't actually solve for any of them. I mean, algebraically, for example, if you try to solve for P, well, you're going to lose, right? Because you've got P cubed and a P and an E to the P. This is what we call a transcendental equation. You cannot analytically solve for P. So, um, why do they do it like this? Well, I mean, this is very often, you know, when, when you make a model in economics, there's a reason why you would write down one of these equations, and that reason might just not 
lend itself naturally to, oh, well, P must always be the following formula. It's just, well, the way these things combine, they have to, you know, all of this stuff on the left has to add up to zero for some reason. Okay, so that being the case, if you were to know for four of the variables, if you were to know how they're changing, and this might be empirical, right? you might literally be looking at you know, data that tells you what these derivatives are, or you may be speculating and saying, well, hypothetically, what would happen if L were to start increasing at a high rate and K were to decrease at a high rate and you know, whatever. Um, knowing those derivatives, reasonable question, how does the other variable change? Right now, again, hard problem. Uh, we can't solve for P and just take its derivative. I don't know how to do that. Right? So how can we uh, find a derivative of something that we can't even find itself um, uh, independently? Well, this is a multivariate calculus problem, as it turns out. You may have seen a uh, sort of uh, sort of single variable version of this called implicit differentiation back in the top one classes. Um, but uh, we're going to see the full, uh, well, sort of, a, we're going to see a fuller version of this uh, in Math 219. And it's, uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's multivariable calculus. Um, so there's a particular aspect of this example I think is really important. Uh, a lot of people think it's, uh, there's no point, there's no practical point in going beyond three dimensions. And the argument is, well, I can draw pictures of one and two dimensions. We live in three dimensions, but what is the fourth dimension anyway? Or is that like time travel? Or is that a Doctor Strange movie? What's the, I don't know, why are we talking about the fourth dimension? This all seems creepy and mysterious and abstract and just not very practical. <laughs> it seems very sci-fi. Um, that is absolutely not true. Uh, and this example demonstrates, because check it out, we have here five variables that we're relating by way of this equation. And we're understanding how they change with respect to time. And so grand total, there are six variables in this equation. If you wanna, if you wanna understand what's going on in this equation, you're doing math in six dimensions. And so I think this is a really good point. Um, again, that, you know, now while uh, it's harder <laughs> to, well, it's basically impossible to visualize six dimensions, right? Um, it's impossible to draw six dimensions. And for those reasons, we will, in a lot of ways, we'll limit ourselves to three dimensions for these kind of practical purposes. But uh, very often, the calculus that works in two and three dimensions just as well in four and up dimensions. And so uh, uh, because of examples like this one, I think it's important not to make the mistake of thinking, oh, anything above three dimensions is sci-fi nonsense. It's just not true. Notice this is not particle physics, right? It's not, um, you know, some super abstract uh, ivory tower kind of math. It's economics. Okay, pausing. Again, questions. I feel pretty good about this. Hope I'm, uh, hope I'm persuading you that multivariable calculus is useful, important stuff. Uh, so that was an econ example. Let me go now to a uh, some physics and engineering. Um, so, um, <coughs> whoops. So, um, electricity and magnetism. E and M. A lot of it. Not all. A lot of it, though is understood by way of Maxwell's equations. These are, this is a, what I've written down here is actually a, uh, sort of a, um, is a very common, but nevertheless a special case of Maxwell's equations. We're not gonna look at the more general Maxwell's equations, that's really very, very hardcore. That's not appropriate to Matthew 19. So as far as we're concerned, this is Maxwell's equations. Um, and uh, pretty scary looking. Right? Um, and uh, among other things, we're going to have to figure out what that is, 
This is an object of multivariable calculus. Uh, we're going to have to make sense out of the fact that the differential over here is not seemingly a variable like x, y, or z. What, what do we mean by dz? What is that? Um, worse, seemingly, over here, we have a differential that's itself a vector. Probably never seen that before. What does that mean? How does that make sense? What is it good for? A bunch of questions. We're going to have to figure out what these objects mean. But more than that, we're going to have to figure out why is this true? Like where does this equation come from? Uh, you know, we can write it down, but what makes us think that this is the case? This is true for reasons. What are those reasons? Okay. Furthermore, understanding this equation will allow us to draw conclusions about physical quantities that are involved here. And so, for example, we're going to be able to understand something about electric fields, something important about electric fields by way of this equation. So there's the question, what does this equation tell us about electric fields? Right? So there's a lot that we need to understand about Maxwell's equations beyond just what does it say. Right? We need to know what does it mean, where does it come from, what do we learn from it? So that's something we're going to be doing uh, in this class. Um, and uh, now real quick, I want to comment that uh, you'll see eight equations that I have circled. Uh, usually people talk about Maxwell's four equations. In fact, these two are typically considered to be two versions of the same equation. Certainly doesn't look like it at a glance, right? They look very, very different. Um, nevertheless, uh, it is true that these are actually very, very closely connected equations. They say almost exactly the same thing. If you look at it from the right point of view, you understand uh, what these objects mean and uh, where they come from. Uh, and uh, so that's another thing we're going to be looking for, uh, is in what sense are these, in fact, the same equation? And again, the fundamental question, why? Right. Okay. All right, and likewise for the, you know, going down. So four equations total. All righty. Pausing again. All right, moving along. Uh, now, this next one, we're not going to study this in Math 219. Uh, this uh, thing here is called Schrodinger's Equation. Uh, this is one of the fundamental uh, formulas, fu fundamental equations involved in quantum mechanics. Uh, and so if you're a chemistry major, you will eventually take a course called Physical Chemistry that will touch on and do a little bit of quantum mechanics. Uh, and if you're a physics major, uh, you will take a full course, possibly two, I'm not sure. <laughs> when I was a physics major, we had to take two. Um, uh, two full courses on quantum mechanics. Um, and uh, so there's a lot to say about it. Um, <clears throat> if you're a uh, chemist, uh, then, uh, well, of course, your main interest in this is, well, a main interest will be why do molecular bonds work the way that they do? Um, how does it? How does how do molecular bonds work? And well, the answer is it. Uh, molecular bonds come from the behavior of electrons. And how do what controls the behavior of electrons? Well, it's Schrodinger's equation. Okay, so Schrodinger's equation, very very important thing to understand for chemistry and physics. And this thing right here is an object of multivariate calculus. This is called the Laplacian operator, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see details about you know what it is, and what does it mean, what can you do with it uh, uh, later on uh, in the course uh, in a month from now. Like that. All right. So uh, three big examples I think here: Schrodinger's equation, Maxwell's equations, uh, made up random um, model from economics. So. Uh, all of these examples are examples showing why multivariate calculus is important. So, so that's uh, you know my answer to this question: Why are you here? Why does your major require that you take this course? That's well, really important for uh, all of these reasons. Uh, and now another way to say that is, um, I like this phrase down here. 
Uh, multivariable calculus is the calculus of the real world. Again, the world is three dimensional. Right? Um, real world analysis involves more than one variable, uh, and very often more than three variables. Right? So, multiple variables is just really, really very natural uh, to be expected, really, uh, when you're looking at the real world. So, if you want to do calculus in the real world, you should expect the question to be a multivariate calculus problem. Did I see a hand somewhere? No. Okay. Um, a, 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 any other questions? All righty. Okay, so that's the intro. Uh, we're going to move on now to the book. <laughs> um, Y'all have my notes already, I hope. Uh, they're in the uh, our, our section, Sakai site, in the resources section. There's a folder called Lecture Notes. Uh, and uh, this is how I'm going to be teaching class. I'll be projecting notes up onto the screen and, you know, kind of drawing focus with the highlighter, etc. Um, to save you all the trouble of having to write all this down, you have the PDF files uh, to, uh, to work on. So... Um, uh, the, the intent there is that you can spend less time transcribing and more time thinking and listening and more productively. Okay. All right. Now, uh, for Chapter 1, a couple of things to say. Um, you've already seen most of this. Maybe different amounts for different of you. But uh, nevertheless, I think there's a lot in Chapter 1 that you've already seen. Um, also, Chapter 1 stuff is uh, relatively readable. Uh, compared to uh, some of the other stuff that we're going to be doing in this class, um, and I'll remind you if, from the from the uh, recording that y'all have already watched uh, on, uh, on on YouTube, I guess. Um, I have to make some tough choices in this class about how I spend class meeting time. Right? Um, there simply is nowhere near enough time for me to be able to cover spend class time on everything that's in the book. It's just way too much. I couldn't possibly. Um, so I have to pick and choose. I try to make uh, prudent decisions. And uh, roughly speaking, what I'm looking for in thinking about what I'm going to actually spend the very valuable time we have in class uh, talking about, I'm looking for things that are really important to the course, uh, things that are really hard to understand. Those are different sometimes. Um, and I'm looking for things, the understanding of which most benefits from seeing uh, a, a live explanation, right? And there are some; those are all three different things. But anything that's uh, high up on any one of those lists is going to be something I'm going to favor actually spending class time on. And uh, stuff that's eh, relatively straightforward, and you can just read it, and not really that much need to spend our class time on. We're better off spending less time on that more time on the more sophisticated, more challenging, more geometric uh, stuff that we're going to be saying uh, later on. So, um, like I say, we're going to be hitting highlights um, going through, uh, especially in Chapter 1, uh, a lot of stuff that I'm going to leave for y'all uh, to read uh, in the book and possibly simply just refresh yourself on from previously. Okay, we're going to start in Section 1.6 because... Uh, 1.6 is where the author gets around to talking about the linear algebra that is, in fact, prerequisite to our course. So I think it makes sense to do the prerequisite material first. Again, I'm not going to talk about most of what's in 1.6, certain highlights. Um, so I think it's very possible. Oh, let me, let me not gloss over this one. Make sure to review all of what's in 1.6 most of which I won't talk about here, but anyway, do, don't forget to review it and make sure that you're actually good on the remainder. Um, so here is a topic that you might not have seen before in Math 2. Uh, it's technically a fact of linear algebra, uh, but uh, it's the kind of thing that can be overlooked. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, you know, when is it going to get used? Yeah, here and there, fairly rarely. Um, nevertheless, it's something that we need to establish of the triangle inequality. And uh, here's what it says. The triangle inequality says this equation in reference to this picture, which means that that distance is less than or equal to the sum of these distances. 
which I like to think of as saying that if you have two points, then the shortest distance between those two points, shortest distance is that straight line. Right? So I think when you, when you think about it that way, it's pretty darn believable um, that, uh, well, of course, of course, that should be less than the same. Everybody buy it? Okay. Um, nevertheless, if you wanted to prove this using algebra, um, this is a linear algebra problem. And uh, it'd be a, a nice exercise if you want to give it a shot uh, to, to prove this. Uh, give, it, give it a try. If you get stuck, I believe the proof is in the textbook. Uh, and if you have any, um, any questions about the, the proof or uh, um, what have you, feel free to come talk to me about it in office hours. All right, not that you need to be able to prove this for the purposes. I mean, it's a linear algebra problem, and this would just be for sort of like, uh, you know, polishing off your linear algebra skills. All right, next. Now, again, um, I'm morally certain that you've seen this before. This I'm bringing up because of how important I think it is. Um, <coughs> so um, how to multiply a matrix times a vector. What is a matrix vector product? Um, so again, I think y'all know how to do matrix multiplications. Um, the most common formula that students use for matrix vector multiplication is what I like to call the dot product formula. So you take rows of the matrix and you dot with the given vector, and those dot products give you the coordinates or the components of the uh, of the resulting product vector. So dot product formula. Notice that's not what this formula is. Right. This is a different point of view on the same thing. Um, this says a matrix vector product is a linear combination. And there it is, right? Linear combination. A uh, linear combination of what? Well, it's a linear combination, apparently, let's look at the formula, a linear combination of A1 through AN. Oh, well, those are the columns of the matrix. This formula is telling us that a matrix vector product is a linear combination of the columns of the matrix that you're multiplying by. What linear combination, one could ask? What are these coefficients? Well, notice up here the coefficients are the coordinates of the vector that you're multiplying the matrix by. All right, so now I'm uh, strongly suspicious that you've seen this in Math 218. I don't know how much emphasis it might have received in Math 218. Uh, for whatever it's worth, I think this is uh, really, ultimately, if you had to pick one, one point of view only on matrix vector multiplication, I think this is the one. I encourage this one more than the dot product formula. The dot product formula excels with numerical Computation. If you have a matrix of actual numbers that you know, and you're multiplying by a vector of actual numbers that you know, dot product formula all the way for sure. It is very convenient, very compact, very efficient, very nice. Um, but here's the thing: that doesn't come up very often. Right? In most circumstances, if you have actual numbers, I mean, just let the computer do it. Why would you sit there and do arithmetic by hand? Let the computer take care of that part. Right? So those aren't the kind of questions we need to be interested in. What we need to be interested in is arguments, you know, mathematical arguments uh, uh, relating ideas to other ideas. And, well, this is really better for that. Notice this formula here directly tells us a matrix vector product is a linear combination. Um, notice that's not what the dot product formula does. The dot product says a matrix vector product is, uh, well, let me tell you about its coordinates. <laughs> All right? It's ultimately not telling you what a matrix vector product really is. It's telling you about something else. It's telling you about the coordinates of the matrix vector product. So this is a little bit more to the point. Um, it relates matrix vector products to another object of interest, namely the columns, right? And so there's, I, I, I argue that there are 
this is a more natural, uh, more idea friendly point of view on matrix vector multiplication. Okay, so um, again, presumably you've seen this in Map 218. Review, make sure you're comfortable with why this is true and how it relates to dot products, and <laughs> make sure you're comfortable with all that. Okay. All right, linearity. Definitely know that you've seen linearity, uh, but just as a reminder uh, of a function, and a real quick side note, we're only going to talk in this class about what I like to call Euclidean functions, namely where the domain is a Euclidean vector space and uh, the uh, target also Euclidean space, Rn and Rm. Okay, so if you have a Euclidean function, we say it's linear if this equation always works. The way I like to think about that is that doing a linear combination on the inside is the same as doing a linear combination on the outside. Or you might say it differently as doing a linear combination before you plug into the function. Doing a linear combination after you plug into the function. Same thing either way. So uh, that's the big idea. Now again, y'all have seen this before. Um, presumably you've seen this equivalent formulation. You can think about it in terms of simpler equations. But there's two of them. All right, so pro con. Uh, and you can also think of it in terms of linear combinations of more vectors. And uh, also pro con. All right, but anyway, this is what linearity means. Uh, make sure that you uh, review as necessary. Make sure that you're good with the idea of linearity. Uh, it, uh, it's an important idea. Okay. We're going to use it a lot. Um, cup, oh, and then terminology while we're here. Um, such a function, a linear function, sometimes called a linear transfer. I hope y'all have heard that term. If you hadn't, that's all it means. Linear transformation just means a function that is linear. Okay. All right. So a couple of examples. Um, this first one is um, a little bit weird, mostly due to an issue of language. Um, we will usually, well, we will sometimes say that dot products are linear. Now, that's a little bit of a math slang. A little bit sloppy talk. Very convenient. Uh, and let me just interpret what that means. When we say that dot product is linear, what we mean is that if you create a function by doing dot products with a given fixed vector, you let that define the function. Right, so this is what P is. This function I'm defining called P is... Uh, Whatever you put in, you're going to dot it with A. So this function takes as its input X um, and then gives as its output A dot X. And I claim that this function is linear. What do you think? This is a good exercise, by the way, to, to uh, confirm that this is true. How do you prove that something's linear? Well, we have a definition right here. You're just going to confirm that this equation works. The way that you're going to confirm that it works, uh, well, again, plug and chug, but you're going to end up using uh, known established properties of the dot product that we know a lot of things about already from math theory. Okay, so anyway, knowing those properties of dot product, you can prove that... Again, saying it sloppily, dot products are linear. Okay. So likewise, cross products are linear. Again, when we say cross product is linear, what I mean is if I define a function as being uh, dot, excuse me, cross with a given fixed vector a, right? Then that takes an input vector x and it computes as its output a cross x. This function, you know, dot product with A, that function is linear. It's a linear transformation. So again, that's an algebra problem to confirm. 
All right, now this next one really is a little weird. Uh, you may not have seen this one before, I don't know. Um, this is about determinant. And before I get started on this, I want to emphasize determinant on its own, not linear. Think about it very carefully now. What does determinant do? Determinant takes a matrix and gives you a number. Determinant as a function that turns matrices into numbers, again, I emphasize, not linear. And uh, again, not too hard to find counterexamples. Pretty easy to find some counterexamples. Um, so what's this linearity that we're talking about? Uh, the linearity we're talking about is not about determinant of a matrix. It's about determinant of, uh, well, uh, this function that takes um, one vector as its input, fills the remaining of the matrix with fixed, constant, not allowed to change uh, vectors. And then we take the determinant of, uh, of that. So D, what I have circled in green here is my function. And it turns a vector, x, by putting it there, by filling in the rest of the vectors, by taking the determinant, it turns x into, well, a number. So this function, this thing I'm calling d here, is linear. Notice d is not determinant. Determinant acts on a matrix. This D acts on a vector. Does anybody see that difference? It's important difference. So D is linear. Um, now, how do we talk about this? Uh, there's different ways that you can say this. And again, you know, there's a lot of slang, kind of sloppy usage in math um, when it's yeah. oh, when it uh, seems sufficiently clear. Uh, we'd like to save ourselves some syllables sometimes. So uh, what we'll say here is determinant is linear in its last row. So by saying in its last row, that's the clue that we're thinking of determinant as a function of only the last row. Therefore, all the other rest of the matrix needed to take a determinant. All the rest of that must be fixed. No. Then only of the last row has been the variable, uh, and that function is linear. So, um, turns out, by the way, that even more than this is true. Not only is determinant linear in its last row, it's also determ it's also linear in all of its rows. Pick a row, your favorite row. Determinant is linear in that row. Determinant is also linear in all of its columns. And all together, all of these facts, that determinant is linear in each of its rows and each of its columns, this is called multilinearity of determinant. Okay, so neat fact. A um, little bit harder to prove, but it's not all that bad. If you were to, uh, um, I mean, y'all have seen determinant, you know, the, the cofactor expansion formula for determinants. Uh, you can, uh, the big hint on how you would prove that this is linear is by doing a cofactor expansion along the row in question. And then unfortunately the algebra gets a little bit ugly. Um, but uh, that's, nevertheless it can be done. Questions? Uh, I have a question for y'all. Show of hands, how many people have seen this property before in Math 218? Just a very small number. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a frustration of mine, I'll share. Um, I, I really feel like this is important. I wish this was a standard topic in linear algebra classes. The problem is that linear algebra, like multivariable calculus, there's a lot that has to get said, and that there's a picking and choosing problem. So they, too, have to kind of, well, yeah, you know, it's a packed course. I'm sure you all noticed in taking 218. A lot that happens, and uh, anything that they add in, well, something else has got to All right. Okay, moving along. Let's see here. By the way, I believe I stop at 2.35. Is that right? Okay, so i got five minutes left. Um, 
Uh, I, this is another important theorem. Uh, I might not have time to go through the whole proof. Um, eh, we'll see. But a neat fact, if you're talking about Euclidean functions, all linear transformations can be viewed as being matrices. In the sense that if you have a Euclidean linear transformation, you can write it in this form for some matrix. There exi- this says there exists a matrix A where that computes T for you. And vice versa, if you have a matrix, and if you interpret a matrix as a function like this, that is a linear transformation. So a uh, neat fact, you can think of linear transformations as being matrices if you're in Euclidean um, uh, space. So now proving it that way, no big deal. That's just a computation using known established properties of matrix algebra. Where it gets uh, a little tricky is how to prove it in the other direction, knowing only that you have a linear transformation. Here's the idea. Here's where I use linearity. Oh, I've got ahead of myself. Sorry. First, let me remind you that every vector is a linear combination of the standard basis vectors. I hope everybody remembers the standard basis vectors. Uh, like So E1, E2, E3, it's like I, J, K. Right? The, the vector is the point, unit vector is pointing along the axes. So every vector is a linear combination of the standard basis vectors, where in fact it's, uh, it's coordinates and the coefficients in that, uh, in that linear combination. Let, you know, come to office hours if you may be not entirely sure about that. Um, here's where I use linearity. Yeah. So what have we what we have established here is that t of x is this linear combination. Let me remind you though that this linear combination is how matrix vector multiplication works. Our goal, recall is to establish that t of x is ax. We want to be able to find some matrix that makes this always equal to that. And well, how am I going to connect these dots? How am I going to how am I going to get this to turn into that? Well, there's a pretty simple choice. It's practically uh, leaping off the page at us. We should just make T of E1 through T of EN, make those the columns of our matrix. You make that choice that uh, that T of E1 through T of EN are A1 through AN, and look, boom, right, we win. Right? T of X is this, which I basically set equal to this, which is what it's supposed to be. So uh, that choice is what makes this do what it's supposed to do. So I think that's a really nice proof. Uh, I think it's important that everybody be comfortable with all of the ideas in here. Furthermore, be comfortable with uh, the the uh, result. And furthermore, please make sure to understand this formula that if you want to find the matrix A that represents a linear transformation, it's a real handy dandy little formula for doing that. And that is just let the columns be the images of the standard basis vectors. That's the magic matrix that represents a linear transformation. Okay. Real quick last comment. Um, in uh, doing so, when you represent linear transformations with matrices, uh, there is a uh, nice related result that, uh, you know, representing, for example, S some transformation S with a matrix A uh, representing T with some linear transformation B, then uh, matrix multiplication corresponds to composition of the linear transformations. 
the really important fact, really useful fact, sometimes we find ourselves composing linear transformations, that, uh, in other words, doing a linear transformation, and then after that, doing another linear transformation. When you do that, you're just multiplying the matrices in the corresponding order. Really nice fact. Okay. All right, and I'm probably out of time. Yes, I am out of time. We'll draw the line right there. And uh, we finished section 1.6. I'll add that to the lecture schedule once I've established that I've hit that mark with all of my sections. We'll, so one one left to go. I have uh, uh, another another class starting in about an hour, um, and uh, I'll update the lecture schedule accordingly. See y'all later. Nice to meet y'all, and uh, look forward to seeing you on Friday. Bye.